Glastonbury, Origins of the Sacred, read by the author, Dr. Tim Hopkinson Ball. For more than 500 years, the word Glastonbury meant an abbey, not a town. One of the greatest and most ancient in the kingdom, Glastonbury Abbey claimed to be the fountain origin of all religion in England. Its abbey church housed the shrines of saints, the tombs of kings, and was the reputed burial place of bishops, dukes, abbots and other magnates, so numerous that the chronicler John of Glastonbury passed over their names for fear of tedium. Its mitred abbot sat in the House of Lords, wielded considerable temporal power and was the confidant of kings. In short, Glastonbury was not simply one monastery or pilgrimage destination amongst many. It was, rather, a spiritual powerhouse and a place of wonder. As Henry VIII's commissioners reported to their master, Thomas Cromwell, in the summer of 1539, We assure your lordship it is the goodliest house of that sort that ever we have seen. We would that your lordship did know it as we do. Then we doubt not but your lordship would judge it a house meet for the king's majesty and for no man else. As one of only a handful of English religious houses, commonly regarded as great and solemn monasteries, the convent of St Mary of Glaston boasted a rich and varied cultural life. Set behind an embattled precinct wall, embellished with many rich and stately pictures cut in stone, were some sixty acres over which sprawled an impressive array of buildings. By the dissolution, the monastery reflected nearly 350 years of uninterrupted architectural development and almost unlimited spending power. Its great church surpassed the cathedral in Wells, its treasury contained antiquities and wonders, and its books and charters were housed in one of medieval England's largest libraries. Its vast estates and economic power resulted in earthly grandeur, but at the heart of all this was the Opus Dei, the work of God, the daily rhythm of worship consisting of the daily offices and masses. But why was Glastonbury so renowned? The medieval answer to this question, the raison d'etre which explained the Abbey's very existence, was its foundation legend, the story of Glastonbury's sacred origins. The purpose of this publication is to provide a brief yet accessible overview of the first 500 years of storytelling about Glastonbury's beginnings, tracing the cumulative effect of its telling and retelling over the centuries, and offering a few general observations along the way. For convenience sake, I have presented this study in seven chapters, although the text constitutes one continuous narrative and concludes with a short epilogue. Despite the subject matter being quite complex, this is not an academic study, and so I have kept endnotes to a minimum. We will not, however, be addressing the literal truth of Glastonbury's foundation story. If you are searching for an historical exploration of the reality of King Arthur's or St Joseph of Arimathea's role in Glastonbury's past, you will not find it within these pages, nor is this a general history of Glastonbury Abbey. Rather, we will be addressing the story itself, what was thought and believed to be true in the Middle Ages and how this narrative was built upon from generation to generation, before the dissolution of the monasteries forced the abbey's closure in 1539. In this respect, the archaeology of the abbey precinct is a largely peripheral matter which seems not to have impinged significantly upon our story. However, we should observe that the archaeology of Glastonbury Abbey strongly supports its ancient origins. Enough evidence survives to suggest that the abbey stands on or adjacent to the site of a high-status Roman building, almost certainly a villa, probably built by a local Romanised British family. Although this might come as a surprise to some, who prefer the notion of an early Christian community established on a virgin site, we know historically speaking that there is nothing very remarkable about a monastery rising in a previously occupied location. In some parts of the Latin West, villas evolved into faith communities and then later into what we now think of as monasteries. In Somerset and Wiltshire, there are numerous late Roman sites with evidence of Christian use, such as the 5th century baptistry in the Roman villa at Bradford-upon-Avon, while at Wells, just seven miles from Glastonbury, the ancient nucleus of the cathedral was seemingly a Roman or sub-Roman mausoleum. At Glastonbury, an unbroken pottery sequence has been recovered through excavation, stretching from the late Iron Age through the Roman, sub-Roman and into the Saxon, including high-status wares in every period. This implies not only continued occupation of the abbey site in Glastonbury, but the presence of high-status pottery, especially in the sub-Roman period, also suggests something out of the ordinary was happening. Combined with the earliest, most substantial archaeological evidence for glass-making in Saxon Britain, dating approximately to the 680s, 
probably associated with the major rebuilding of the abbey undertaken by King Ina of Wessex, the archaeology suggests that while Glastonbury's medieval monks may not have known when or by whom their abbey had been founded, they were right to claim that it had ancient and exceptional origins. But although archaeology supports the claim that Glastonbury Abbey genuinely does have early origins, we must sound a note of caution. Continuity of occupation does not presuppose continuity of belief. As yet, nothing has been discovered in the Abbey precinct which illuminates the religious beliefs or practices of its early occupants, and it would be unwise for us to speculate about them. All we can say at present is that Glastonbury was important from an early period, but we do not know why. We should also stress that although the Abbey eventually claimed a first-century foundation date and founder, this does not imply that the medieval monks understood or were aware of the antiquity of their house, archaeologically speaking. In other words, the foundation story was a pious fiction which owed its creation to happy coincidence rather than inspiration based on the literal relics of Roman Britain. We will also be exploring the context which contributed to the origin story's growth and highlighting an element frequently overlooked by Glastonbury historians, the role of lived spirituality and material religion. In other words, we will look at sacred objects, events, personalities and phenomena in medieval Glastonbury, all of which formed an equally important influence on our story's development, either by prompting revisions and contributing new elements, or even causing events on the ground, both literary and literal, which in turn fed back into the foundation story's evolution. Admittedly, this is a difficult task, as almost all our evidence for material religion and lived spirituality in medieval Glastonbury is now literary. Only descriptions of objects and events survive. But it remains pivotal nonetheless. It is difficult to underestimate the importance of sacred objects and divine intervention to the medieval mind. And this is something of which we should certainly remind ourselves while exploring the origin story's context. Although often forgotten today, Medieval religious houses either knew precisely when they had been established and who was responsible, or, if they were particularly ancient and their origins somewhat hazy, they promulgated foundation stories to establish and explain their origins. As we shall see, the surviving medieval sources addressing Glastonbury's origins demonstrate that foundation stories were not fixed. Rather, they slowly grew in elaboration, developing as the centuries passed. Even a cursory glance at these stories suggests that medieval culture was not rigidly prescribed by a monolithic Catholic church, but was hospitable to the extraordinary. In this regard, although the story which explained Glastonbury's origins may appear fabulous to us, it was not exceptional. The monastic community of Westminster, for example, maintained that its house had been founded on the site of a Roman temple of Apollo in the 2nd century, by the mythical British Christian King Lucius, and that in the 7th century St Peter himself had miraculously consecrated their abbey church. Through the story of its foundations, a church explained its existence and proclaimed its sanctity, both to itself and to the wider world. But these were no simple tales. The range of illusion they contain is often dense and not easily digested, and these stories should not necessarily be taken at face value. Combined with the fact that we are considering text in translation, and that translations can vary markedly, we must proceed carefully in our quest. While we may tease apart original texts from later editions, or attempt to date early charters to their actual time of composition, it is highly unlikely that our medieval reader or author would have understood our concerns, or even cared about them if they did. A forged medieval charter or text was not forged in the modern sense of the word, Rather, it recorded in writing what was known to be true, believed to be true, or even ought to have been true about a place, person, or event. We should also ask ourselves whether an author understood the difference between history and legend. Was an author's motivation pious or political? Who was the audience for which an author's work was intended? Our concerns and priorities today are not necessarily those of our ancestors, and it is important not to confuse our preoccupations with theirs. We must also be mindful that written materials become dated. It is all too easy to assume that the manuscripts and charters in a medieval library were constantly in use, whereas they aged and became unfashionable as books do today. Just because William of Malmesbury referred to a manuscript in the 1120s, for example, does not necessarily mean that it was still available a century later. As a privilege in Glastonbury's Great Chartulery, a 14th century collection of abbey deeds and charters observes, Sometimes there are no documents to be seen. 
since some have perished of age, others have been burned and others lost by hostile acts or other accidents. Manuscripts were also updated, revised, improved and edited for a variety of different reasons, and it is often difficult or indeed impossible accurately to trace these changes in surviving works. We must also remind ourselves that literary materials were not freely available for the scrutiny of all, even those who could read. Indeed, throughout the Middle Ages, libraries and archives were exclusive domains to which only the privileged were admitted. And even then, sparingly. When the historian John Leland required access to Glastonbury's library in the 1530s, wisely he brought a letter of introduction from the king himself to guarantee sight of the Abbey's collection. Over the last century, Glastonbury's history and traditions have received considerable academic attention. During this time, the Abbey's foundation legend has been addressed in texts by scholars from a variety of different backgrounds, many of which are utilised in this work. But despite such industry, we must not forget that our assessment of Glastonbury's past stands solely on the literary and physical remains of a medieval abbey. Only 40 or so manuscripts come down to us from a library which may have held thousands of volumes, and perhaps 5% of the monastic buildings survive to the present day. As we shall discover, notwithstanding such losses and the passing of nearly half a millennium, although the principal elements of Glastonbury's foundation story are known and relatively straightforward, it nonetheless constitutes a surprisingly complex tale. In consequence, there is much we will only briefly touch upon, and far more which we must, of necessity, leave out. Bearing all this in mind, we shall now turn to the story of Glastonbury's sacred origins, and through its exploration we might come to understand why medieval Glastonbury came to be dubbed England's holiest earth, and reflect upon the largely forgotten story which still underlies Glastonbury's attraction for so many people today. Thank you.